All right, everybody, here we are. It's Friday. What day is it? July 22nd, maybe? I don't know. It's late July. It's a Friday. We're here with our good friend, Garrett Dauncey, on Brigadoon Radio. We're going to do a little one-on-one discussion. Guys, do you like these? We spent, you know, I know you're a fancy designer, but look at this, man. Popsicle stick. I like it. Index card. Scoop Very stuff. <laughs> Gareth, where are we finding you today? Uh, you find me in West Wales, and I'm sorry I was looking down. I'm just making sure I'm turning my phones off so we don't get interrupted. And I say phones because of the app. I ended up with two, an Android and, a, and an Apple, which is very odd. But, uh, yeah, weather, it's been mad sunny all week, and we actually had the hottest day ever in Wales on Monday on record, which is slightly worrying. Um, but it's cooled down now, so it's pleasant. I love it. I am desperate, as you know, to visit the west of Wales and Cardigan someday. Hopefully 2023. My passport has arrived, man. I'm back in the game. I'm ready. I can leave the country. I can leave the country, possibly. Um, let me ask you, some of the, you're like west of Wales. I guess you're on the Irish Sea. Or do you, I mean, it is the Irish Sea, or do you call it the Atlantic Ocean, or what do you call that body of water? I think it's officially called the Irish Sea, but in the app, we had to write a little blurb. Uh, which was about my biography kind of thing. And at the end, I called it the Welsh Sea. So any opportunity I've got. Oh, the Welsh Sea. I love it. The cold Welsh Sea. But nobody in the world will call it that other than me. And I like the idea of uh, nicknaming things (laughs) with a kind of Welsh bias to it. Because it... uh... Ireland is is it directly across or is it north and west of where you are or can you literally yeah can I so see Ireland if I'm on your beach right top to bottom of Wales you would I think Ireland would uh, pretty much extend past that and there's a we live on an estuary and the southern side of that estuary sticks out it's called Caymans Head and from yeah. there on a clear night on the top you can see the hills in Ireland so you can actually see really see to it yeah but it's, it needs to be a, a particular sort of um atmosphere so how many miles is that 25 30 miles or is it less or... <laughs> i don't know i'm not i I'm, I'm far from a facts and figures man i'm a much more kind of broad brushstroke sort of person so i can see it i'm going to clear how far that is i wonder how uh yeah i'm a huge fan i love that you call it the welsh sea because i'm a huge fan of maps and geography and uh you know maps are constantly changing like they're never really they're never set in stone i mean and they're open to all kinds of interpretation and um, why stuff gets named and, you know, the way people reference stuff. So, yeah, well, I'll start a, calling it the Welsh Sea as well. We'll start yeah. a movement. I love it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a chap I follow on Instagram. I can't remember his name. I can send you a link after this. But he often does maps of America and he collates the most odd, but it almost seems obvious when he does it, information. And he makes um, kind of uh, infographics of them. And it might be. Right. I saw one this week, and it was um, the most rewatched rerun state by state. So you had this whole area, which was parks and recreation. You had another area, which was the office. Certain area data was, wasn't available. A very small area was Friends. I think Brooklyn was Brooklyn 99. And, it, and it does these maps, so <laughs> they're brilliant. And you can, you can overlay all these different layers of um, different demographics on them. And it's cool, really cool, because they're funny as well. Now, there's uh, one of my favorite Twitter accounts is called uh, Horrible Maps. So uh, I don't know who's behind it, but like this week, it was uh, Taiwan and it had mainland China's West Taiwan, right? Like, but the maps are, they don't make any sense or they're like, uh, uh, they're just fantastic and they're, they're a lot of fun and they provide, they're just endlessly, maps are just endlessly entertaining for me. What was interesting when President uh, Trump was in the White House, he was constantly telling the Mexicans, you know, you're going to pay for the wall. We're going to build a wall on the border. And the Mexicans are like, great. You know, we're happy to use the map from 1850 when Mexico extended, you know, all the way up to Colorado and Utah and most of California. Right. So the Mexican, there was a joke in Mexico city <laughs> where like, we're happy to build a wall, but we're going to use this map, you know? <laughs> so fantastic. Um, all right. That's the end of the geography lesson. Let's get into it. Um, you're an architect, which I absolutely find fantastic. You're also a reluctant budding entrepreneur who's <laughs> launched a very interesting tech application around uh, mental health. I want to talk to you, you know, our audience really kind of interested in emerging issues. Obviously, health and wellness is a huge topic, but also performance and entrepreneurship. And um, I think what's, I'm going to put some words in your mouth, but I think from my background, what's really interesting, you've taken your skill set 
as an architect, um, your own personal experience and also harness this network, you know, you kind of built around the world and engaging with the do network and whatnot to launch this really powerful tool that's been really well received called Mood. Um, and I think to be an architect or to be an entrepreneur, you need a skill set, you need a passion, kind of personal connection, right? And it always helps to have some kind of network to help, you know, tell the story and spread it. So do you agree with that premise? I do. Uh, and I think the one thing that's missing from it is the motivation to do it. So, you know, I had, oh, to, interesting. Yeah. I had to fix my own problem and I had for myself, but in a very basic way with pens and a calendar. But it yeah. wasn't until I met a community of people in lockdown who all felt the same that I started to think I better do this for other people as well. And then it wasn't until one of those people who had a, her own audience, the person who set it up, Ruby Wax, it wasn't until she wrote about it in her book. I mean, she did ask me. But if she hadn't have asked me, I probably wouldn't have got to the point of designing it to be a proper thing. So all of these little nudges almost seem inevitable to make me feel guilty bound to have done it. So fixing my own problem, finding other people with the same problem, that was the motivation. And then it was a case of, right, how do I actually make this real in the world? That should, yeah, so it is like execution is like super key. Like, obviously, there are a lot of good ideas out there. You know, and if, if you have the idea, probably 10 or 12 other people have that same idea. But it is all about execution, right? Like actually doing it. And I recall that great line, in the movie by Aaron Sorkin, The Social Network, where, uh, you know, I don't know if Zuckerberg actually said this, but, you know, basically said, if you would have invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. That is, I actually did it. Like, you know, I actually launched this thing. So there is something to be said about having an idea, but at the end of the day, yeah, it takes the execution to actually hit send and get it out there. But I think the thing which differentiates a lot of stuff is that if you scratch your own niche, you have such an intimate knowledge of the problem that you understand exactly how to handle the problem. So the answer I came up with to go on a phone just sort of poured out in about half an hour, the first sketch I did in terms of the concept, and I'd never seen one like it before. So all the things I was trying to do, it like, you know, make the picture actually beautiful in terms of trying to destigmatize, make it so easy that even if you can't get out of bed, you just one tap a day, you know, all these things came from an intimate understanding of feeling like that for two to three years. I, I didn't even know how long it was. So the stuff I was being offered or the other things I would see when I wasn't well, none of it appealed. And it always felt like it was this kind of almost patronizing sometimes because it felt like it was always coming from a place where somebody hadn't been there themselves. So I think that's a key component as well is the empathy you'll have with the thing you try to solve and therefore it immediately is recognizable when other people with the same problem see that thing so does that make sense yeah yeah so let's like maybe we should step back and uh because obviously me and you know the app very well we know mood very well um you know obviously i i've played around with it you actually are doing it putting it out there and been talking about this now for months um let's just talk about like the concept of this kind of daily check-in so Getting back to um, your own kind of mental health journey, you were recognizing you wanted to kind of, I guess, if I, I don't put words in your mouth, but you wanted to track your kind of like your good days and bad days, if you will. And you were doing that very simply on a pad with yeah, colored pencils. It is as simple as that. I, I basically got so overwhelmed with life, work, everything, and just kept going that I ended up getting to an absolute rock bottom and a crunch point. And then I decided, right, I've got to get better. And shedding the things that were kind of making me ill or, or burned out, I suppose. It, it was that combined with having to do other things to try and help myself. But I wasn't really sure if anything was changing because I had no realistic sort of baseline to compare anything against. Right. So because I had no baseline, I don't even know how I felt in a moment. And if you try to imagine what you felt like a week ago, let alone a month ago or six months, you haven't got a clue. So I realized that I simply had to literally see how I feel. It's yeah. literally as simple as that. And I bought this calendar and pens and didn't know why. And they were just sitting on my desk. And um, I was just attracted to them in the shop for some reason. 
And then about three or four weeks later, I was thought, oh, New Year's Eve is coming up. Why don't I make a mark each day? You know, each color will represent something on a scale. And I'll just see. And then I could see these patterns emerging. And as I made changes in my life, I was trying to adjust those patterns by making specific changes. And then over time, I could see it starting to happen. And then COVID came and it was like a guillotine. And <laughs> all the stress just relieved overnight because my work stopped. And the oddest thing of all was that um, work stopped and the threat of no money coming in was far outweighed by the relief of the stress. So literally, you could see these patterns and colors just almost abruptly changing at that point. Right. And then I would learn more and more until, if you think of, if you learn to sail, you often oversteer because you've got to steer like this into the wind. And when you eventually can sail, you, you don't do it so much. So if you turn that this way up, it's kind of like this when you're trying to do stuff. But as that settles down, you end up sort of being on an even keel. And now it's just really an early warning system for me and a check-in. So I right. now, I've kind of reaped the benefits of seeing the patterns and trying to adjust those. It's not to say that won't happen again. You know, life changes all the time. But I'm at a point now where it's more like a canary in the coal mine in a way of... Um, having this trigger and prompt to check in with myself. And, but then I'm noticing new things because since about 10 days ago, I've, been, I've just had 10 really tidy, consistent days. It's never happened before. Right. And now <laughs> the oddest thing is making me now want to invest in that. So I'm doing things every day now to actually take more care and to try and keep it at that level. So it's, it's odd. It's acting as a motivator almost now. Had you checked it? Have you... I mean, had you done that elsewhere in your life where you tracked or checked in or monitored Never stuff? Anything. Whether Never, yeah. because I'm not somebody who's into data at all. I'm much more into feel, how you feel about yeah. it. Like if I design something, I usually go on site on my own and just walk around and start to get feelings about the place. And then the more I do that, the more I start to know what the hierarchy should be within that space, what the important things are and why. So no, I, I don't. I'm not really a data-driven person, and that's why there's no language or numbers or anything with this. It's just a visual thing. So a yeah. picture paints a thousand words, but if you can make that beautiful, and if you think of an artist painting, if you're this close to it, you can only see the brushstrokes. So being able to see things at different scales, like months and years, all of a sudden you, you get a different perspective. And especially, I mean, I, I've seen recently a seasonal thing which I've never noticed before. So I yeah. started to realize that actually I've got to find a way in the winter to be out in the garden, invested in it for when the spring comes, as opposed to just sitting indoors in the rain. So let me, what, what made you decide to take the leap from, so you start tracking this in a very analog way, calendar, you know, uh, yeah. and then what made you decide like, oh, I, maybe there's a digital application for this or well, why did you, you, or why should, should it, should it be digital or did you resist that at first? Yeah, no, there's lots of reasons. So I, the motivation for doing it was I showed the calendar to the community in Frazzle Cafe and a lot of people wanted something like it. But um, we've talked in the past, you know, I, I, got quite, I don't know if they're extreme or not, but I, I've got quite entrenched views on how we live and the impact we have in the world. And that's part of the reason I've been depressed in the past, knowing the effect we have on other people. And how we, you know, how the West is kind of um, propped up. But the thought, so the thought of making another physical product would have been hard for me to live with because it's more stuff in the world and it's more stuff that would end up as a landfill. Right. And most people have already got a phone. And because of the way the app has been designed, which is a completely about the individual, it's not backed up with servers and things. You download it, it's on your phone, it takes a bit of memory, all the data stays on your phone, and that's mainly because of privacy, but it also means that it's it's a lower impact thing. So I just felt that if I could piggyback on the back of something that everybody's already got, I could live with myself in terms of, because I want lots and lots of people to have it, but I didn't want to create another mountain of stuff to get buried. And the other thing with the phone is that they're so good these days, it's, you know, I could make it give me the potential to make it beautiful. And I mean, you know, sort of jumping out at you beautiful. And also because it's data driven, it means that the, that information could easily be 
transposed into something else, like an art project or, you know, a campaign or a, using clothing or anything. So, so it just sort of worked on all levels, really. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a well pencil. pencil. Well, no, I, I mean, I was thinking about, like, how important it was for you. I mean, it's very simple to use a piece of paper and a pencil and, like, keep track. I mean, absolutely, myself, I love paper. I love pencils. And whenever I just, I don't know, I love buying pencils. It's like, I don't know, it's a very comfortable oh, I do thing. Well. I, I understand entirely. I've got all sorts of different um, softnesses and, yeah. Yeah, pencils and just the uh, the application of it and, like, you know, just the the – the process of like putting pen to, or pencil to paper and how important was you when you went decide to make the digital leap to be like this has to be i don't know as smooth as frictionless yeah, as simple must, as pencil yeah, and I mean, paper the, the big thing i was influenced as well by bj fogg and um his tiny habits right and when his book came out i attended one of his i couldn't call it a course but it was an explanation chapter by chapter and actually, his assistant Stephanie was one of the beta testers on the on the project. And his graph of motivation against ability, and his equation of needing a prompt, really struck home with me. And the difference between two taps and three taps, or one tap and two tap, if you can't face getting out of bed, is probably the difference between maintaining the habit or not. And when you're at your worst, maintaining the habit is that it's most important. So. The fact it's on the phone as well allows you to have the prompt to come up once a day. And that prompt, through the tester's feedback, I started to realize just how important that was because one person said to me at the, uh, originally, um, or they felt like it was a friend checking in on them, but a non-judgmental friend, how are you right. today? But then I started to hear that more and more. So the check-in and the tone of the check-in, I started to realize People, some people actually ended up looking forward to it. And I realized what a, what a absolutely essential component of the whole thing it is. So, and also that that's outside of the app because you might not even want to see the picture every day. But right. what's important is that it comes up and it just asks you a simple question, how do you feel today? And of the five shades, you just tap the light of the mood or the light of the shade. And that's it, that's it, it's done. And it just says, got you, got it, see you tomorrow. Whereas if it was a pen and paper, I know from my own experience that there was lots of times when I just didn't do it. And, you know, you'd have to, it's more of an effort. And I think any barrier to it would have also made it less likely that you would do it consistently. So let me ask you, when you're in like, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but say a rough patch or you're very down, um, I say you, like the royal you, right? So is there a benefit of, breaking that cycle even if it's a quick check-in is that just based on your own experience is there science behind that or is there like if i'm down in the dumps for 24 hours and even if i just check in for 30 minutes or change my thinking or do some other activity is there a healthy benefit around that is there a mental is it a break for you or why is it important to like check in or be disciplined or like engage in these kind of habits um well I think the more self-aware a person is, the more they're able to navigate life. And it's not just reacting to every single thing that's put in front of you. So what I realized eventually was that um, having this kind of overview of where my natural line was, when, I, when I'm fluctuating from that, it was allowing me to put things in place to try and get back to that. Whereas in the past, when I didn't do it, I would just flail from one thing to the next without any kind of conscious um, trying to consciously direct that. So seeing the picture of myself over time has been super helpful in that respect. So, and the check-in as well, if you think of emotions, you have, you know, the, the idea of mood, the word mood, is that that is almost like an average of emotions over time. So, right. if took, so if you took a day, you might have all sorts of different feelings and emotions throughout that day. And depending <laughs> For sure. on that day when you ask yourself, you have a different <laughs> conception of actually how you feel as a general. Sorry, that's my sudden <laughs> knocking on the door. And um, the, 
the thing I really learned is that for me, mornings were quite always the worst. And if I held on to that, I could convince myself almost through the rest of the day that it was still bad. But when I actually started to check in and look back on the day as a more objective sort of practice, what I would realize is the day fluctuates like this. Mm-hmm. And I would try to make the entry based on how I felt the average was for that day. And often I would realize, actually, it hasn't been a bad day at all. It's just that I've been carrying this one aspect of it through me. And the more I did it, so I've done it probably for two and a half years now, the more self-aware I became and the more I was able to actually see the reality in real time as well. So I guess it's a bit like getting to know yourself in the same way that you get to know somebody else. Well, you mentioned two people said that they were looking forward to checking in. Do you have any observations around that? Or like when people say that, are you surprised? Are you, are you like, lot, oh, that makes sense? Stuff, yeah, a lot of stuff ended up um, surprising me, actually, from the feedback. And, I, I, you know, so in terms of people looking forward to checking in, I guess that probably comes from the point of view of the more they were doing it, the more they were seeing a little bit of extra stability in their life. So therefore, it was almost a point each day then where they were taking five minutes for themselves as opposed to the busyness of life, you know, if you've got kids, work, right. whatever. So it would almost be a, a not an oasis would be too strong a word, but it would be a point of mindfulness in the day where they would actually try and step back and reflect. So I think the people who were saying that to me were probably finding that they were feeling better as a consequence of that as a practice. And because of that, I think that then becomes like a, you know, a perpetual thing, which is it's just motivating you then to do it more. So if I describe what it's like with depression, you know, you start to see everything bad and that just reinforces everything else that's bad and you end up making this vicious circle. And what I've realized over the last couple of years with this is that it's quite possible to make a, 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 the opposite of that, almost like a virtuous thing the other way. Yeah, and I guess just thinking about, yeah, the check-in is like you actually have control over those five, 10 minutes or 30 minutes when you want to think about it. I mean, I do suspect we have a lot of control over our lives, but they're also overwhelmed with a lot of responsibilities, family, friends, work, our own passions, our own desires, and, and there's tons of distractions. Like the planet is just full of distractions and there's all kinds of people, businesses, you know, activities, entertainment, don't want to steal our attention. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess having that little bit of control, the checking in the physical process or being the discipline must yeah. be very positive. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's not for everybody. I mean, I definitely, you know, when we went through the test as we had over a hundred people and I pretty much talked to everybody intimately afterwards. And, you know, if you don't need something like this, you, you just simply don't need something like this, but, there are an awful lot of people who do. Uh, so it was the kind of majority that found a lot of value in it. And the people that didn't quite need it could still see that it could be helpful for those that did. So um, it's not the sort of thing where I would say every single person in the world ought to be doing it. But I do think the more self-aware people are, the more balanced they can be in their lives for definite. Yeah, and motivation is great. But I think discipline or just when I think about uh, when I talk to clients, it's about communication. It's just, you've got to be consistent. Like you've got to yeah. produce and speak on some kind of consistent basis. Um, and that delivers more than motivation. Like motivation comes and goes, but being disciplined, tiny yeah. habits, um, you, that yeah, seems to deliver the best. And they compound. And I've designed it absolutely for the person that hasn't got motivation. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Which Honestly, is good. Because, yeah. you know, at that point, you, you've got no motivation. And I know people who were testing this, going through all sorts of things like bereavements and proper depression, deep depression. And they find it really useful coming out the other side to look back at it and realize that it wasn't as dark as their mind was telling them. And then they felt more hopeful. And then they would catastrophize the future less as, well, uh, yeah, less as, a, as a consequence as well. Not always. If it was getting worse, hopefully that would be picture that you could show somebody and ask for help one of my favorite books is uh turning pro by stephen pressfield and he basically talks about making the leap from being an amateur to being a professional 
right? Um, you know, like you and me, we both have gardens. You're probably much better at it than I, or you know, <laughs> just play more time. <laughs> but it's like an amateur type situation, right? right? Whereas, like, if you're a professional gardener, you got to be disciplined. You got to be all in. You got to be, you know. And when you make that leap to being a pro, to being disciplined versus motivation, it makes a big difference. Um, so let me talk to you about, you've launched this thing, you're out there. Uh, I joke about, you're like the reluctant entrepreneur. Like, I don't think you really, you know, it's, like, true. it's absolutely true. You've unleashed this tool, which has been well received. It's already got a global audience. You know, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, how are you wrestling with that? I mean, are you wrestling with it because you're like, you li listen, I just want to launch this idea, put it out in the world, or do you feel compelled to shape it even from a slight commercial standpoint? Or are you wrestling with that? Or is it too early in the journey for you? I think I was very naive when I started it. I had this idea, you make something and it's good enough. And if it's good enough, it sort of organically grows. <laughs> it will go viral. <laughs> yeah. But what I've realized is that when I talk about myself, and why it exists and what it's done for me and what my bigger ambitions are for it in terms of destigmatizing a lot of these conversations and mental health generally. I, uh, I've really realized recently that it's gonna take me to be talking a lot to give it the integrity and the, uh, give it legs really. And I don't know how long that'll be for, but it's all, I've only been on social media for a few months. Yeah. And my entire life, I've avoided it like the plague because <laughs> I, I can see that it depends on the platform. And I can see that there are really good benefits. I don't just mean commercial. I just mean in terms of linking with like-minded people. But on a lot of platforms, that's very difficult. But also, I can see that it's, it's not just necessary, but it, it really shape so somebody sees it and when I talk about what it's done it, it has given some people hope so I almost feel like I was duty bound to make it I'm duty found duty bound to keep talking about it <laughs> to, to give it legs and I do look forward to a day hopefully where it's got legs and what I'd really like is that it's got enough legs that I can be the person concentrating in the background on the charitable side of things and there's other projects I'd like it to lead to, but for it to lead to other projects, it needs to get to a certain size so that, you know, there's an income coming in that can be reinvested in it. Well, this is a good reminder. I'm just like uh, the app itself has a prompt, you know, it asks you a question. Um, it's a good reminder. I mean, it's a great idea and, but ideas need to be stimulated and talked about and uh, you know, I mean, Coca-Cola still advertises every day, even though I'm pretty sure everybody on the planet knows Coca-Cola, but they're still out there telling their story, and um, which is, it's not great. I mean, you know, it's a huge challenge to launch an app, get it out there, and then you're like, oh, I've got to market it. I've got to, like, tell the story. I've got to, like, constantly champion this tool. Um, but what's, what's really cool that's happening now is that I'm having conversations with people who have been touched by similar problems in their own lives and they've got big audiences or they're connected to politicians or whatever it is so i'm probably going to try and kickstart some sort of campaign called see how you feel and i'm thinking that hopefully you'll be with a sports team but a sport you know a recognizable sports team right so you know, their mood is incorporated into their kit or it could be individuals who are renowned for perhaps a certain look. So if you know, there's quite a few people with knitted jumpers. And you could imagine a knitted jumper in these patterns. So somebody's made up a t-shirt for me with my mood on it. And I'm just gonna start wearing it and see what people say, because I think it's a great way to kickstart conversations. It could be something as simple in the future as say somebody has been through something, but they've documented their mood. And then at some point they've got over that and that journey is represented in something. It could be a piece on the wall, it could be a piece of clothing. It could be anything. And the more people get used to sharing these pictures, the more conversations start and the more it doesn't become such a stigma. And I think taking it away from language helps no end with that because it's a universal language. Right. And it's being non-threatening. So what I've tried to do is kind of 
enable and make it easier for these things to happen because so many people are in pain. It's, it is literally, you know, there's so many drugs prescribed. Yes. It's and I, think, I think if you can get on the preventative side of things rather than the let's fix the problem once this exists side of things, it, it's huge. And I don't think solutions to some of those things need to be complicated. And that's why I think it's about empowering the individual. And then when the individual wants to share, they can. But it's, it's it, do you see what I mean? It's not about like some big, grand, massive scheme. It's about a very simple little tool that you give to an individual. And if enough individuals do it, hopefully, then there's a benefit at scale to society. I know that sounds over the top, but that's basically the motivation and the vision for it. No, I think it's great. What I like about it is that it's just mood. It's not happy mood. It's not sad mood. It's not, it's, it's just okay. mood. It's just like, this is what's real. Yeah, I've always been really resistant to, you know, be happy. Like, I'm not, I'm a, I don't know. No, I it's, definitely it's, am not, I'm a happy, joyful person. People probably don't know that. They're probably surprised by that. I come across as a bit aggressive and gruff and, you know, I also like a bit more realistic. And I realize, and I don't know if it comes from playing sports, but you have all, like, when you play sports, you have really great highs and you have great lows. And it's not great and every life. day. And, and that's entirely Yeah, and that's life. life. And what I've learned is to embrace, this is part of the way I got better. I've learned to actually not struggle with those lows anymore. And right. To embrace them. I literally embrace them now and I just let them sit. And what I've noticed is you're not wrestling with them. You're not, well, I, I understand why as well now. You're not fueling them effectively because right. you're not triggering a certain aspect of your brain. So I actually, even though I, I prefer not to feel like that, I don't fight it anymore. And Usually with me, it's not a trigger to something like losing at something or, you know, just or even problems in life. It's just usually for me, it's, it kicks in at a sense of overwhelm. So when I've got too many commitments, that tends to be the trigger for me. But it's irrelevant what the trigger is for me because everyone's different. But I agree with you completely. I, I, I you know, if you ask anyone to define what happiness is, most people will struggle. And to me, I subscribe to the kind of more Buddhist way of looking at it, where it would be the absence of suffering. But that's not what's peddled. Happiness is this kind of, you know, euphoric state. And so I agree with you completely. I, it's the entire range is life. Yeah. Um, we spent some time in California, which is an amazing place, very special part of the planet, but it seems a bit disconnected <laughs> from like reality. And obviously now living in DC where, you know, you're surrounded by the U.S. government. You know, I'm just down the road for the Pentagon. I mean, very serious stuff is discussed here on a global scale. And it's a very serious town, whereas, like, L.A. It tends to be a bit more joyful and because of the geography and, you know, what happens in that city. And I think that's what's somewhat important. I also like this idea of one of my favorite bands is a tragedy hip out of Canada. And one of their songs is it can't be Nashville every night. That is, like... Sometimes, you know, you're going to play in Toledo, Ohio. It's not always going to be Nashville every night. And it's like, that's always like a good reminder too. Like, yeah, some days it's going to be bad or some days you're not going to be great. And what are the activities or what happened during that day that caused that to happen? It's a good reminder. But the funny thing as well is that what I've really learned, <clears throat> because even though I say what I'm striving for is just a kind of middle ground with a bit up and a bit down. I'm not right. guys and I certainly don't want big loads. So I've got a pretty consistent sort of life, really. And, but it's become that. And, it's become, and, and I know I've learned through these patterns that I've noticed what keeps me sane, really. And a lot of it is kind of physical things as well. So being outside in nature, you know, so it's not these big events and it's not looking forward to this or that or anything like yeah. that. It's just, just going to the beach, seeing the, seeing the Welsh Sea is a great, honestly, is a great thing. I know it sounds like, you know, it sounds so benign, but it's just these small everyday things have become super important to me. And I think that in the past, there just wasn't any space for them in my life. And now they're back. You know, I'm different. And I look back at what I was like a few years ago, and I sometimes don't recognize. I feel sorry for the guy sometimes. And at other times, it feels very <laughs> raw, and it feels, you know, oh, my God, it's yesterday, it's me today. But so... 
it's not just so the mental it's, it's, it's like a part of the whole thing isn't it your brain your body it's all your well-being generally it's all part and parcel of the same thing and how you feel i use as a measure really and a barometer to help me navigate that i think like to um it's been interesting just in the past 12 to 36 well 12 to say last one to two years right i look at like I follow sports a lot and there's been a huge, almost like burnout around kind of solo athletes, like tennis players, gymnasts, um, both you and me are solo entrepreneurs, right? Um, it's almost like people that aren't working on a team absorb a lot more, you know, anguish, if you will, or they don't have kind of outlets. So as more and more people, excuse me, become solo workers or work remotely, it does seem like having some kind of check-in process whether it's as simple as going to an app, it's going to be more and more important. I couldn't agree more. And also, I mean, I couldn't have done this without Marco, who was, um, I met via Do as well at uh, Do Breakthrough. And I started working for him on a project in Italy. And one day I showed him the drawings. I've been trying to bootstrap this and I wasn't getting very far. And um, I showed it to Marco. He said, oh, we can help you with that. And, you know, Marco's part of it and his company Red & Co with his wife Mira. And having that other person, even though we're not a company together, was invaluable because I didn't want someone to change me or my design, but I wanted somebody to make me better. Right. And normally I don't need people of the caliber of Marco. Um, and I don't just mean as a person and trust and things like that, but I mean as somebody with an eye and, you know, as kind of, very high level of um, very high standards. So having Marco hand in hand for the period of taking it from those sketch designs to the, you know, ending up in the app store was invaluable. And, you know, I'm still working for Marco on his project in Italy. He's out there right now. <laughs> and we, we'll be talking later probably. <laughs> and I'm trying to explain, you know, the realities of, working w with what you've got where you are because you know he's in italy i'm in wales he's used he's, he's renovated a few houses himself in the us in portland and austin and each context gives different challenges but so i'm trying to make him better basically i'm not trying to change his vision or i'm, I'm simply trying to make him better on the architectural front in the same way that he was able to make me better on the app front and we're a great team and uh who knows what we'll do in the future, but it's nice to have somebody that gives you confidence as you're moving forward because you've got somebody to bounce things off and yeah. you listen to each other. And, you know, if I can see Marco's uh, see something different, but it's actually better, it's bang, that's what we're doing. And, and the same the other way. So we don't, <laughs> I don't think we've ever disagreed, actually. You can tell when I'm saying something is better and, and the same the other way around. And that's to me, is a first. I've never experienced that before. I've always been on my own. And that being on your own thing definitely adds to the stress because there's no one there to validate or even just bounce something off. So this is a new experience for me. And whilst I don't want to be a company as such with employees and all that kind of thing, finding some way to, to, to work with somebody in this way, I would say is key. Yeah, I think there's definitely going to be a rise in kind of like solo entrepreneur, hybrid teams, you know. Um, I think the days of the – I mean, we're going to have still kind of big, giant companies, but, you know, I think there's just so much more technology and it's so much easier to connect with people around the world and it's but exciting. It but um, Because we worked – Marco's team is international as well. Yeah. So we're all in different time zones and they did something they'd never done before, which was include an outside person as part of their team. So Marco and I – effectively directed the whole thing, you know, hand in hand. So we'd have to find times when everybody was available. <laughs> so we'd have these odd times for meeting. And I'd never, you know, I'd never worked like that internationally before. And I'd certainly hadn't used the kind of um, products that they needed to use to make that happen. So, you know, in terms of trying to make posts and comments on each other's work and things like that. But it, came very naturally and it was a it was a good experience well i love that you've made the time to speak with us today um we can find it's at mood app 
that io right it's in both the amazon yeah, it's, it's very difficult to find on the uh, app store so that's that is definitely the way to do it via the website mood app so mood app.io and then uh yeah but it's available on android and apple and yeah where do you see it going i mean what uh do you are you are you happy where it is or do you are you, are no, you no, just no, like no. to make it massive i mean my mp was one of the beta testers member of parliament and he's already shown it to the mental health minister in parliament and the the welsh health minister so i'm hoping to have conversations with them because we were talking about for the price of the prescription you could effectively have a tool where you're trying to prevent the need to have a prescription <laughs> so so I'm trying to get as upstream as possible. So what I'm finding is education. The amount of people I've talked to is in different sectors, but the difficulty with public money is often, even if there's a will, it's quite hard to access money. So unless you can join the dots of the the people at the top to the people at the bottom who actually need something, it's very hard to make those two things come together. So that's one thing I'm assuming. But the other thing is to try and God, there's almost too many things going on. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I could literally go on all day. I was talking to somebody in New Zealand last night who's going to introduce me to a, trying to introduce me to um, an All Blacks legend who has um, uh, suffered depression and is a big sort of ambassador for mental health because I'd like to be doing something with sports teams, like proper. I'm talking to somebody who's, probably talk to somebody who's got early onset dementia from being a, a rugby player. Yeah. And talking to just no end of people. And it's, 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 it's relentless. <laughs> but I think what will happen is hopefully they're all seeds and some of those seeds will grow and whatever grows first is, um, it'll just be the direction I'll start going in. So at the moment, I'm in. I'm to take the garden analogy. It's spring, and I'm planting seeds nonstop. <laughs> and I hope I get a chance to water them as the sun shines. Um, and then whatever grows first, I guess I'll be harvesting. So, you know, that's literally what's happening at the moment. I love it. Well, that's a good way to wrap up. If uh, people want to track you down, what's the best way to reach out to you? Is it on the Twitter machine or probably LinkedIn? Because I've been okay. on LinkedIn for a few months now. So it's Gareth Dauncey, D-A-U-N-C-E-Y. And it's really surprised me, actually, how enjoyable it is to connect with people on there and to have conversations with people. It's, it's pretty cool. And it's actually got me right in the odd bit as well. So as I'm realizing more and more, I put a little post up, on, which kind of tried to tie mood into other things that I'm noticing in the world and behaviors. Well, I love it. You're uh, becoming quite the juggernaut, Gareth. Who knew? It's very exciting, man. <laughs> thanks well, thanks for making the time. We will see you again soon on Brigadoon Radio. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>